Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is Mass Memorial See Me Sunday School for January 14th, 2024, and I'm Sister Sharon. We're on our winter quarter, Faith That Pleases God, Unit 2, Learning About Faith. Today's lesson, Faith and Trust. Our key verse today is a verse that's familiar to many, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And our lesson scripture is Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. The New King James Version is what the version I'll use. And so we talked about, we've been talking about faith for a while. And we know Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So now again, today we're talking about faith and trust. Let's look at our background. Well, before our background, I have from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The time is always right to do what is right. And so as we this weekend celebrate Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday observation or commemoration. And so I wanted to say that to everyone. The time is always right to do what is right. Now for our lesson background. So the Old Testament is divided into four, sometimes five divisions. These divisions are the law, which is called the Pentateuch or Torah, which goes from Genesis through Deuteronomy. Then there's history, which goes from Joshua through Esther. Then there's poetry or wisdom that goes from Job through Song of Solomon and sometimes includes, includes limitations. Then there's prophecy, which goes from Isaiah through Malachi. And this is sometimes split into major prophets because of the size of the book. That's why they're called major prophets or minor prophets when it's a short book. So today we're going to be in the poetry or wisdom division, and we are in the book of Proverbs. And proverb means a concise saying that illustrates the truth. And so in the book of Proverbs, it has many writers. The name writers are Solomon, Agur, and Lemuel. And Solomon wrote and collected about 3,000 proverbs. And we can see this in 1 Kings, the fourth chapter, verses 29 through 34. Now, this is an excerpt from a textbook for life in the Word and Life Study Bible talking about proverbs. And it says, Proverbs is one example of a form of writing known as wisdom literature. Each proverb distills life into essential categories of right and wrong and gives instructions for how to pursue good and avoid evil. The end is to help people attain full, meaningful, and successful lives. The key word here is wisdom, the skill of living. Ultimately, wisdom is found in fearing God, knowing what he wants, and doing it. The characteristic two-line form of the proverb was by design. The lines of the couplet could, re could reinforce each other. We see this in Proverbs 11, 29, um, Proverbs 15, 10, and Proverbs 18, 10. It could provide a, a contrast. So we can see this in Proverbs 12, 22, Proverbs 19, 16, and Proverbs 28, 11. It could provide a comparison such as Proverbs 11.22, Proverbs 18.11, and Proverbs 21.1, or complete a thought. And we can see this in Proverbs 17.12, Proverbs 22.6, Proverbs 35. So in Proverbs, you see these two line forms called couplets. This structure made the couplet easy to remember and therefore easier to teach. This formulaic approach became especially useful during periods of stress and national crisis. So something straightforward, a little couplet for us to remember. And we're going to look at our lesson today. We have eight verses, but they are basically in couplets. So it's in a set of four couplets. Now, today we're going to talk about the heart. And heart, by definition, means the center of anything, the most interior organ, the most central and essential part or basis. And Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, we need to guard our hearts for everything you do flows from it. So one version says, for out of it flows the issues of life. And so our heart is the most central of anything, okay? It's the most central and essential part of us. And so we're going to talk about our heart today. Now, talking a little bit more about heart before we get into our lesson, what are we guarding that is in our heart? So Proverbs 4.23 tells us to guard our heart well, what's in our heart or what should be in our heart? And so just so you have some, I suggest you look these up later. 
Okay, we're not going to go through them now, but it says, what are we guarding that is in our heart? The word, we see this in the 119th division of Psalm verse 11 or Deuteronomy 30, 14, that we're supposed to guard the word in our hearts. You know, in, in Psalm 119, 11, it says, so we won't sin against God. We're supposed to have the law, Jeremiah 31, 33b, faith or belief in Jesus. If we look at Romans 10, 8 through 10, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Wisdom, Proverbs 14, 33, the first part. Gladness, Psalm 4, 7. Truth, Psalm 15, 2. Melodies of praise, Ephesians 5, 19. Missions or ministries, Nehemiah 7, 5 gives us an example. Talents and gifts, Exodus 35, 35 gives us an example. And we also hold eternity in our hearts. And that's found in Ecclesiastes 3, 11. And look at the Amplified Version for that. So this is what we should be guarding and holding in our hearts. That's what we should have in our hearts. In the most central part of us. Now let's look at our lesson. And so we talked about these couplets. And so what I did is I called the couplets. I, I was trying to figure out a word to call it. So the first part of the couplet, I called the requirement. And the second part, I called the result. Okay, so that's nowhere in the Bible. I just wanted to say, I couldn't think of what did I want to call it? So I called it the requirement and the result. And so you see the two parts of the um, couplet. Okay, so starting off with Proverbs 3, 1 to 2. The requirement, it says, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. So again, guarding that law, uh, guarding the commands of God. So again, Psalm 119, 11 says, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So what do we want to do? We want to hold on to God's law, okay? And not in a legalistic way, okay? But it's written on our heart. So we want to obey God. That's what it's saying. Obey God. Okay. And keep and whatever he says to do. You know, one of my um spiritual sons says, Well, Lord, um, he he excuse me, he says, Um, Mama Sharon, do you have a word from the Lord? And I tell him, Obey God. And or I'll even say, What are the two words? He'll say, Obey God. And so it's that idea that um in our hearts we keep the commandments. We obey God. You know, Jesus said that we're his friends if we obey him. And so that's what he's saying. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. So even if Solomon is writing this to a son, and it doesn't say who wrote Proverbs 3, but if he was writing it to a son or whether it was someone else who wrote this, it's the idea that he's telling his child, okay, hold on to what I'm telling you. It's important, okay? Um, you need to keep my commands. And so just like God is Father God to us, he's telling us, hold on to what I've told you, okay? Keep my commands. You know, in other words, hide my word in your heart so that you don't sin against me. Now, if we remember the law, if we keep the commandments, what's the result? It says, for length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. Okay. Now, you know, life is determined by God how long our lives will be. So, you know, you can't say someone has a short life or a long life. It all depends on what God has for you to do, you know, and so that idea is that you will complete what God has for you to do, and so it says, for length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you, so here I give us Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verses 19 through 20, the first part, and it says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you, and God has set this before us, life and death, blessing and cursing, and then he tells us what to choose. It's like a multiple choice test. And then he tells us the answer. He says, therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days. So the requirement is to not forget what God says. The requirement is to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. The requirement is for us to obey his voice and to cling to him, okay? For he is our life in the length of our days. Now, the next couplet is Proverbs 3, 3 through 4. The requirement part says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. 
write them on the tablet of your heart. So this is the New King James Version of this scripture. And I wanted to give you the amplified version of the same scripture. And it says, do not let mercy and kindness and truth leave you. Instead, let these qualities define you. Bind them securely around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Remember, your heart is your innermost who you are. That this should be what defines you. And so you want to know if people said your name, like if they said, um, Sister Sharon, how am I defined by people? Am I defined by mercy and kindness and truth? How am I defined? And so we want we don't want to forsake those. We don't want to not have, we don't want to not be merciful. God was merciful to us, you know. We need to be merciful to others. Jesus is the truth. We need to stick to the truth. God is full of loving kindness, is one of the fruit of the spirit. Okay. We need to have this fruit. So it says, do not let mercy and kindness and truth leave you. Okay. Or, and then we say leave you, but it's the idea that even saying it this way, don't you let it go. It's not like it's leaving you. It's you letting it go. So it says, do not let mercy and kindness and truth leave you. Instead, let these qualities define you. So everyone, how are you defined? If someone was defining you or your character, how would they define you? They should be so they should be bound around our necks. Like, like in the winter, we wrap those scarves around tight. They should be bound around our neck. Or sometimes I drop my key, I have a, a lanyard and I keep my keys around my neck and I go, oh, it's right here. I can feel it. I can feel my key. And so the same thing. Can I is mercy right here? Is kindness right here? Is truth right here? And I'm kind of touching right here. So, you know, is it there? Is it in my heart? Is it on the tablet of my heart? Is it written there? Okay. Um, that's what we need to do. That's the requirement. Now, what's the what is after that? Well, we got to go a little bit further. I give us Micah 6 8 because it says in Micah 6 8, He has shown you, oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does God require? But to do justly, and here it goes, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. That's what we're supposed to be, how we, how we should be defined. Now, what's the result of this? Verse four says, and so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. So when we, going back, when we, do not forsake mercy and truth. And we keep it tightly around us and we write it on our hearts so that it's the central part of our being. So it's what defines us. Then what happens? The result, we find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. And so I wanted to give us an example. And when I saw this expression, I, um, verse four, I said, I remembered something. What would Jesus do? Now, we used to have those bracelets. I'm going to hold my arm, little um, silicone bracelets that said WWJD. And I was going to just write WWJD, but I didn't know whether people these days would know that that means what would Jesus do? But if we look at Luke, the second chapter, verses 49 through 50 and verse 52. And this was when Jesus had just um, his parents, as far as his earthly um, father, Joseph, and his mother, Mary, were looking for him and he wasn't with them and they had to go all the way back. That's when he was like 12 years old and he was in the synagogue and they were like, why did you do this? They were, you know, upset about him not being with them. And then Jesus said to them, this is what I'm reading. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And then verse 52 says, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So I wanted to give us this because this is what Jesus did, okay? And um, imitate me as I imitate Christ, okay? So we're we're Christians, we're Christ followers, we're disciples of Christ, of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus grew, increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And wisdom is the fear of God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, okay? So, or reverential fear of God. But it's that side that he... He grew in favor and high esteem. Why? Yes, he was Jesus, but also verse 49 tells us he was about his father's business. 
Are we about our father's business? So again, we need to be, be defined by mercy and kindness and truth. That's how we need to be defined. And if we're defined that way, if we have it written on our hearts, tightly bound around us, around our necks, okay, then we'll find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. And we will be doing what Jesus did. Going about our father's business. Now, these are the verses we know quite well. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. And this is part of our key verse today. The requirement part says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Okay, that's the requirement part. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And then what's the result? And he shall direct your paths. He shall direct your paths. So I'm going to give us these verses again. This is the Amplified Classic version. And because I want you to look at how they define the word trust. It says, lean on, trust in, and be confident in the Lord with all your heart and mind. And do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all your ways, know, recognize, and acknowledge him. And he will direct and make straight and plain your paths. Now, I didn't print this out, but one commentary says, does that mean to throw away common sense? No, it doesn't mean to throw away common sense. But sometimes our common sense isn't sense. And we need to go to God first. We need to go to God first. We need to go to the word and, and find out what God is saying about a situation. So it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And the word trust one reason why I gave you the Amplified Classic Version was how it says, lean on, trust in, and be confident in. So the word trust in Hebrew means like to lean on or to support, okay? So we, okay, we can't lean on our own understanding, okay? If we lean on our own understanding, we're going to fall, okay? But we can trust, we can lean on God. As we lean on God, he's got us, Okay. He'll take such very good care of us and he won't let us fall. And so we need to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Going deeper on this, there's an excerpt from the Tony Evans Bible commentary. And it basically just says, life is crooked. And I know I've told you all this story before, but my, my sister Angela, she, um, ended up one, she wanted one of those journey necklaces that looked like, um, you know, little you know, diamonds or cubic zirconiums going, going down and they get bigger, bigger, bigger. And she told uh, my brother-in-law that she didn't want one that was straight because life's journey really isn't straight. She wanted one where it was zigzaggy. Yeah, let's tell the truth. There's not a straight line, life's journey. So here, um, this excerpt from Tony Evans' Bible commentary says, life is crooked. <laughs> Okay, it doesn't take long to figure that out. He says, he will make sure your road reaches the right destination. An old axiom says, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. You know, love that because it's mathematics, right? The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But when you are walking in the will of God, everyone, your life heads in a straight line, no matter how the road curves. So it might look like life is crooked, but God still has you. And let's say that straight and narrow way to eternal life. It is a straight line. So again, when you are walking in the will of God, your life heads in a straight line, no matter how the road curves. Because there'll be obstacles and, there, and we know there's things, you know. And even as people, even as commentaries were talking about Proverbs, you know, they were saying, yes, we know if we look at Job and Ecclesiastes, how things have happened to people biblically, even happened to Solomon, okay, who wrote many of these Proverbs. But still, he's saying, trust in God, lean on him. Yes, there'll be obstacles. Yes, it's going to be curves, but he's still making your way straight. He's still got your destination, okay? He's still, um, you're still going to reach the right destination as long as we let Jesus lead us. Now, this is an excerpt, and I have it written this way because that's how it was written back in 1997. 
from Reverend Lawrence L. Reddick III's Lean on God. So I didn't put any more titles because this is, I wanted to quote it from the African-American devotional Bible. But, and so it says, this is an excerpt from Reverend Lawrence L. Reddick III's Lean on God devotional. And it says, to trust in the Lord is to acknowledge and affirm that God is both loving and faithful, that he is dependable. To lean on him with more than our understanding, Proverbs 3, 5, is the beginning of real wisdom. For then we realize who we are in relationship to him. To be wise is to know that our greatest knowledge, our deepest insights, and our clearest thinking are only pale shadows in comparison to God's wisdom. His wisdom is far above ours. It is from his eternal and omniscient, which means all-knowing, viewpoint, that he guides us and makes our path straight, Proverbs 3, 6. Knowing that God and only God is always dependable, okay, everybody knowing that God and only God, the rest of us are not dependable, knowing that God and only God is always dependable is the basis of wisdom that is more precious than rubies, Proverbs 3, 15. So we need to lean on God. He's got us. He's our support. Now, the last couplet we have in our lesson is Proverbs 3, 7 through 8. The requirement says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. So if we're looking at that, the first part where it says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Proverbs 14, 12 clearly tells us there's a way that seems right to a man, but his end is the way of death. So we need to be careful about what we think is um, wise in our own eyes, or I think is good. And you have to be careful because there are good things and there are God things, okay? So go all the way back to Genesis, okay? Um, Adam and Eve, you know, they saw that the tree was good for food, but it was uh, they were disobedient to God when they ate off of it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? So... They saw that it was good, but was it God? So see, wise in their own eyes, they were wrong. And it led to a way of death. And then, so again, the requirement says, do not be wise in your own eyes. It says, fear the Lord. And that's reverential fear, okay? That we need to honor God, respect God. We need to know he's God. He's God, okay? And it says, depart from evil. Psalm 34, 14 says, depart from evil, and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Okay, so we're chasing after peace. We we want some peace, that peace that passes all understanding, guarding our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So what's the requirement? Not to be wise in our own eyes, not to think more of ourselves than we need to think, not to get prideful or haughty, okay? Um, stuck up, with other words for it, you know, they bougie, all the different words. It's like, do not be wise in your own eyes. You know, you, you, you're, not the expert, you're not the expert on everything, okay? And some people act like they're the expert on everything when they, when they might not even have any training in anything, okay? But the idea is, even on things we might be, we might know because of book knowledge, God made the book. <laughs> so it's like, God made the world. So do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Remember, he's God and depart from evil. What's the result? It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. And yes, we go through some health challenges, but we know that by Jesus stripes, we are healed. Okay. But we also know it says in 3 John, the second verse, because there's only one chapter, 3 John, the second verse, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. So it should be that as we study the word, as we trust God, as we fear the Lord, as we depart from evil, as our soul prospers, okay, that we will also prosper in all things and in our health. Because some decisions made, we're not making decisions that God told us to make for our health. So the idea is, but as our soul prospers, as we hear God, 
as we obey God, as we trust God, then it will also be health to our flesh and strength to our bone. These are the eight verses of our lesson, Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. Okay, the requirements and the results. Now, to summarize this, because we are celebrating the birthday observation of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I found this quote, and it says from him, it says, Christianity affirms that at the heart, and that's why I like this quote, we talked about our central part, at the heart of reality is a heart, capital H, a loving father who works through history for the salvation of his children. Man cannot save himself. Okay, that in other words, that would be us trying to be wise in our own eyes. That's in us finding a way that seems right to us. We, we cannot save ourselves. For man is not the measure of all things, and humanity is not God. Bound by the chains of his own sin and finiteness, man needs a savior. So we thank, you know, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. for this quote. Just to remind us that a heart, the heart, is our loving father and that we need a savior. Our lesson is on faith and trust. And so everyone in closing, trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is our lesson for this time. Be blessed. Loving Christ. Sister Sharon. Thank you.